Being a gamekeeper, springtime is one of the busiest times of year we have. Taking care of these farms and the management practices we do, it's a year-round process. But springtime, it's a new beginning for the year. We're coming out of wintertime where we finished up all of our trapping. We're getting ready for turkey season coming up. There's just a lot of stuff that's going on. Today I've got Corey coming in to help me. Corey's kind of a right-hand man. He's been with me for a few years now. We're going to come in. We're going to clip the rest of our corn stalks that we had remaining from our fall plots last year that we deer hunted over. That's going to expose some of this grain that we'll be able to set a blind up over today. These birds are pretty patternable this time of year as far as uh, when they're grouped up in early season. They're going to be on the food sources. So that leftover grain we had is going to be a great place that we can pinpoint a good spot for these kids to hunt. Looks like, looks like my package for biologic come in. Uh, all right, perfect. This is, uh, this is what I've been waiting on. Little organics. It's, uh, it's a processed poultry litter mix uh, that you can put on, you can use it for your garden, you can fertilize trees with it. I'm excited to get this out and uh, see how it does. Fertilizing oak trees, especially white oak trees, I can't emphasize enough how important that is. We'll come in with the new organics blend that they have. It's great to fertilize that oak tree. Some of the places that we look to do this on farms is good bow hunting areas. You know, we'll try to find a good white oak tree on top of a ridge that the deer are already crossing. Maybe it has a saddle on it or something, and we'll strategically fertilize two or three of those oaks. All right, here we are, my magic white oak tree. Uh, we've been fertilizing this tree for years and it's been a good producer for us. It's put out acres some, sometimes when no other oaks around here has. So I want to use our new organics product this year. We need to put two pounds of this per 10 foot of our drip line. On this size tree, I'm looking at the canopy now and I'm going to say our drip line is around 30 foot. So I'm going to need to use this full six pound bag on it right here. Now we need the rain to get it worked into the soil and the ground temperatures come up, start, sap start rising up and we'll reap the benefits of doing this little tree right here. Some of these farms that is just covered up with oaks, if we can pinpoint one or two in strategic locations, then it's gonna make that little spot just a little better. It's gonna make it a little sweeter. It's gonna put out just a few more acres. So I don't wanna look over any of the spots on these farms that we can fertilize these trees and kind of narrow down a spot that we can hunt later on that fall. One of my favorite things to plant and to maintain is clover. And it's not a magic bean that'll maintain your farm year round, but I think it's the one food source that we can provide that's gonna give us more days of the year that is desirable than anything else we can plant. I do a lot of seminars and stuff, and I've always been asked, what is the one thing that I can put on the farm that's gonna help these animals more than anything? And, and I always answer it the same way. A variety of what you're planting is the best. You, you need a good percentage of annuals and perennials, but for someone that might be on a tight budget and they can only afford to plant one thing, or they only have the time to plant one thing, Clover Plus is my favorite. Clover is, is thriving right now. It's jumping out of the ground. Those ground temperatures are coming up. It's exploding, and it's gonna provide a lot of uh, bug habitat. It's gonna provide a lot of food for the turkeys, for the deer. It's just pretty much a food source that's gonna be there for more days of the year than any other time. The beauty of Clover Plus and the one thing I love is that they add in chicory. And chicory is a plant that, uh, and ours actually hadn't popped out of the ground yet on this new blend because it hadn't got hot enough. It likes that 95 degree high humidity heat. When we have those dormant times in the heat of the summer and it gets pretty hot here in West Tennessee, the clover might start wilting and, and withering, but that chicory is just thriving. So this one field can still hold those deer in the summer when all the clover's starting to go dormant. When you put that plan together and, and you might be constricted on how much you can do, don't overlook how much clover can help. 
As we're walking around looking, this is one of the things we don't want to see. We don't want to come up on any kind of carcasses or dead animals. And as we look at this one, I can tell that it's a young buck that's perished in the last two, probably three to four weeks. Well, looks like we lost one of our young bucks. And I can tell he's already shed, the pedicle crowns are here. And this deer, from what I can tell, probably died of stress. And in my opinion, stress is the number one killer of whitetail deer. People don't realize how hard a rut is on a whitetail buck. Their testosterone level is so high, they're not eating as well, they're not resting. So the longer that that rut is gonna go on, then the more stress is gonna be on that animal. And what's gonna elongate the rut is your buck to doe ratio. One of the management practices that I can't emphasize enough is taking out the does to try to get our ratio as close to one to one as we can. I've done a lot of seminars, I've done things over the years where people have said, well, I don't wanna take out my does, that's what's birthing all my new deer. Well, it is, but they're gonna birth those deer at a 50-50 rate. That's my belief. And I feel like if we're continually to take the bucks out and we're not doing any doe management, that it's just taking that ratio in the wrong direction. If you're that guy that likes to deer hunt, but he goes out on opening day, shoots a buck and goes home and doesn't come back and take care of your does, you're hurting your deer herd more than, than you can ever imagine. You're hurting it for your farm and your neighbor's farm. I don't care how many food plots you plant, I don't care how much CRP, how many trees, what kind of lake management, pond management. If your buck to doe ratio is not right, you're gonna have this. Take the does out of the herd, get your balance in, and don't let this happen in the springtime. Years ago, it was an accident how I got started in outfitting. Any young kid or almost anyone that's interested in bow hunting, you could travel around to different farms and ask farmers to hunt, and everybody would let you hunt on their farm. A friend of mine back then had found a giant shed. It's a deer with about 32 points and drop times. And at that time, it, leasing had just started. So I ended up just starting a little website, got three or four people the first year, and that led into the next year. Those people wanted to come back, and they had friends that wanted to come. We had some success in the get-go. People started coming, the business got bigger and bigger, and originally that's how it got started. The fun and outfitting that I've been doing is really was meeting people and, and, and making friends across the nation. I also really enjoy seeing their faces killing a Boone and Crockett animal or their first turkey, or it's just a lot of joy for me to see others be successful in something they can't do where they live. To join Gamekeepers, visit GamekeepersClub.com or pick up a magazine at Tractor Supply, Walmart, or Bass Pro Shops. I'm Ed, also known as Dad, kind of the jack of all trades around here. I'm not a mechanic, so if you buy a farm and, and you have somebody connect, you're going to need a mechanic because it seems like every day something breaks. I always had plenty of things to do for myself, keeping up with a farm, house one day or another, but it seems like Jared's always got something else that needs done. We keep everything running for the business keep the uh, operation going. Dad's always there. He's a mechanic. He's been a mechanic his whole life, so he always knows how to fix everything unless it's computer operated. But without him, I wouldn't be able to get all the food plots done. It took him a little while to realize it, but I think he finally has come to the conclusion that I'm pretty good to have around, that he'd be lost without me. He's ran bulldozers. He's taught me how to do all that track hose, so now me and him together can roll into a property and. and really get it developed quickly, but yes, you, you have to have a mechanic to keep everything maintained. Dad just got the disc hooked up to the Kubota. We're gonna go back and scratch the ground a little bit, plant some wildflowers. We're also gonna disc an area around some prairie grass to put down some clover. A cost-effective way that a lot of people don't think about is planting wildflowers. If you've got an area uh, that the soil is not real good, you can plant wildflowers. They develop a deep tap root, which will go in and break up the soil, get the water, filtrate it, leave your wildflowers there for a couple of years to improve the soil. They also produce the flowers that attract the insects that your turkeys will come in and bug on. It's a great forb for the deer in the fall. It's a cheap and effective way that people don't really think about. Plant some wildflowers and they really look cool.
When it comes to food on your lease or your piece of property, whenever my dad and I, when we first get a, a farm, I, I look over the map, I see the surrounding properties, try to see if they have corn, soybeans, if they have clover fields or alfalfa. Number one key to me is clover. They'll eat that for 10 months out of the year. It's easy to maintain, mow it, clip it, spray it. Mossy oak has a non-typical clover that works great. Turkeys love it, the deer love it, rabbits love it. That's the, one of the keys to me. Managing properties, and that's why I like GameKeeper so much, is that I love managing the wildlife. I love taking a piece of property that's just rough, it's just sitting there, maybe it's grown up an old pasture, grown up thicket. I love going in and changing that property, developing it, making it better for the quail, for the turkeys, for the deer. I like trying to make the deer, it's almost a chess game to me. Figuring out early season, late season, wind directions, thermals, picking out a buck, fixing up that property, make him do what I want for my clients or for myself. All right, Jared, just got this 80 acre lease. How do I make this a good spot to hunt? Okay, well, what I originally do, I, I go ahead and look at all my landowners first. I look at my prevailing winds second. You got a lot of agriculture fields here and uh, I think these were CRP grass fields. All right, well, this guy's gonna, I'm sure, harvest all his crop. But I try to see how much hunting pressure I have. I don't even think they allow hunting here, so we know that, I mean, this should be a super spot. I mean, you should have big bucks. Do I need to be worried about that this is right along a road? Oh, I, I'm always worried about that. If you do have an issue on your 40-acre lease or 160-acre lease, if, if it's along a road, then I plant the blind spot for mossy oak. It has a sedan grass, Egyptian wheat, maybe some sunflowers. I plant that 10 to 12 feet wide, and that blocks anybody from the road seeing into your property if you have your fields on the edges. This is what I planted last uh, late May, early June. But I put the blind spot right along the road. You can do that about 12 feet wide. And I know it's knocked over right now, but it's been a year later. But you have to replant it each year. It is an annual, but I go back in there, I mow it, I disc it. I take my four-wheeler, I spread a little fertilizer on there. If you have one, you can just go in there with your six-foot drill, and I usually do it twice. And I drill that back in. You do have to do it every year. But you can see that will all be a soybean field, so that blind spot will be there about 10, 12 feet high and you can't see in. So nobody can see your deer that are back there. I also use blind spot going into hunting locations and I try to get into a blind, I plant the blind spot, I can walk down the edge of that with deer not even seeing me get into the property. As an outfitter and what I've seen over the last 30 years to get into more detail into the food plots, if you've got the space, clover's great, that's my staple, but if you want to get even deeper, early season they'll hit the clover. But you can get alfalfa. Deer love alfalfa. Alfalfa, clover, and soybeans are great early season, but you need to think beyond early season. That's when I plant my corn, but you can also plant biologic maximum. You can plant biologic sugar beets. That's my secret that we've learned in the last few years, a tip I got from a guy. It's these sugar beets, the deer in our area absolutely love them, and I'm seeing across the Midwest, late season deer loving sugar beets, the super product. So that's the late season, turnips, sugar beets, winter wheat, maximum. Those are all great corn, carbohydrates for late season, your clovers and your alfalfa for early season. In my opinion, you need both to keep all the animals on your property year round and give them the nutrition that they need. Weather plays a major role in the spring, especially this time of year, turkey season. You, you need to have all your equipment maintained and have it ready because it may rain for the next seven days and then not dry out for another five or six days. So as soon as your soil temperatures get right and your land gets dry, you need to get your food plots in, get your corn in early, get it out immediately to get your best yields. But a good thing is dad loves the mechanics. So luckily for me, dad can be back home fixing the tractors, getting on the dozer, planting the food plots while I'm out chasing turkeys. Right around that corner. We can't get any closer. We're gonna have to get over here in the wheat. So let's just set up right back here.
Troy, here they come. They're coming up the road. Get ready. <laughs> as a gamekeeper, just as a bit of encouragement to tell you what I've seen over the years, as even myself, sometimes I'll get a new farm or I'll get a lease or, or a piece of property I purchased and go in there and make the improvements, whether it's 60 acres, 80 acres, and just try to make your small piece the best you possibly can. Here's another thing I do. We came in and we planted two fields here of uh, native grasses, then the hens and turkeys eggs, so just like the uh, native vegetation. But anyway, we planted prairie grass in here. The turkeys love to come in here and uh, lay their eggs and have their poults here. It's along a creek bed, so we have water right here in the creek. Walk down here, then down here I planted clover and alfalfa. They love to bug in the clover and alfalfa. I come in and mow it so they feel secure, they can see, they're close to cover, they've got water. The one thing that also helps me kill a lot of gobblers in the spring is, is putting in this habitat, the, the prairie grass. The birds like to come in here and nest. Uh, a lot of people, they're trying to think of what to do, buy the best gun, you know, buy the best products out there. But on your property, if you can put in the cover, we're close to water, then I come in and planted clover and alfalfa. It's just like your deer, if you can pull the does in, you gotta think about your hens. If you can pull all the hens into an area to bug where she feels safe to take her poults, helps with her survival rate, what shows up? The gobblers are gonna show up if the hens are there. So this has helped me with a lot of our success. Stay encouraged, make the improvements, put out the food plots, the roads, the hinge cutting, plant the prairie grass, stick with it, stick with the program and it will pay off in the end. <laughs>